but I'd like to just start out by saying a huge welcome to everyone joining us this evening. My name is Brenda Padgham, and I'm the Conservation Director with Bainbridge Island Land Trust. And we're thrilled you're joining us this evening after a wild weather day of talking about one of our favorite preserves, uh, Agate Passage Preserve. And our formulation of a French group to help us take care of and steward this really special and amazing place. Um, before I go much further, I'd like to acknowledge that the land of which we work is within the Aboriginal territory of the Suquamish people. Expert fishermen, canoe builders, and basket weavers, the Suquamish people live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's Central Salish Sea as they have for thousands of years. And we are proud to call the Suquamish tribe a big partner that helped us preserve the Agate Passage Preserve. I'd like to also introduce a few other folks that are going to help with the program this evening. Um, and Greg Gian is a volunteer lead steward. He's on our board. He is a neighbor to the Agate Passage Preserve. He has been out there stewarding this land, oh, since we purchased it and before. Um, really helpful in the acquisition and interpretation and taking good care of this land. And um, Greg, I didn't know if you wanted to say a few words to about yourself and your interaction with this landscape. Um. Yeah, okay. Um, I, um, my background's in geology. I'm a retired geologist. Um, that's enough about me, but I'm, I'm, I've been, uh, you know, a keen uh, environmentalist since I retired and moved to Bainbridge Island. I've been, I started, uh, I was in the second class of docents at Islandwood, and so I've been supporting them for a long time, and I've got involved with the land trust. Um, more recently, and uh, uh, and became really interested in the Agate Passage Preserve because it's so close to to where I live. And uh, we've talked a lot of us in the land trust have talked for a few years now about the idea of having uh, lands that the land trust owns uh, stewarded, not just by uh, uh, normal land trust. Uh, volunteers and staff, uh, but getting other neighbors and interested people involved that maybe don't want to be direct land trust volunteers, but they, they're interested in one particular property and would like to help out with it. And so we've, we've tossed around ideas about it and uh, we're ready to, uh, we're ready to kick off our first sort of pilot program and to try it out at Agate Passage Preserve, see if we can get a group together and uh, exchange ideas within the group, which we haven't, we won't start probably tonight, but ideas about how we can work together and work with the land trust to, uh, to take care of this, uh, this special property. Great, thanks, Greg. And um, it goes without saying, Greg will be very involved in the friends group, helping coordinate and keep folks together. Um, in addition to, I think I'll introduce the next person joining us, uh, Andrew Fraser, who's our stewardship coordinator. Hello, um, as Brenda introduced myself, I'm Andrew Fraser. I'm the, the guy with the uh, shades and the hat in that photo right there. Um, and I like to say I'm the, I'm the boots on the ground guy. So um, what we, as land trust, we do a lot of great work um, protecting properties, preserving it, and then that whole what do we do forever part gets <laughs> into my lap. Um, and we have a lot of properties across the island. We have a lot of really great volunteers, um, but I can't be everywhere. And um, I get a lot of people like, hey, trails are filling in. we got some weeds. We're going, you know, there's a lot of great people who live around these properties who are using it regularly that... Um, they really just need to get the A-OK -okay from us to go forth and do what they really want to do. So that's kind of uh, what this is all about, is to um, talk about the properties a little bit, get that history, get that context, talk a little bit about what we're looking for, kind of standards, and then 
letting you all do what you do as such great members of the island and um, users of the properties. Great. Thanks, Andrew. And folks should know Andrew is um, trained in restoration ecology. He's a wealth of knowledge about the flora and the fauna, uh, especially the flora and especially the bad flora. <laughs> <laughs> and has just been uh, truly integral in implementing our stewardship program here at the Land Trust. I'd also like to introduce Lexi who is helping facilitate and has put together um, the communications. Um, Lexi, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Lexi. Like Brenda said, I'm the development and communications coordinator with, coordinator with the Land Trust. I just started about a month and a half ago, so I'm really excited to get to know all of our fantastic volunteers, um, as well as get to know the amazing lands that we're working with. So I do a lot of the more behind the scenes work. I wrangle all of the volunteers and keep track of all of you and help coordinate all the events. And I'm really passionate about connecting people to place and to land. So I'm really excited about this project. Thanks a lot, Lexi. All right, well, let's dive in and we'll continue to monitor our um, entry. So let's talk a little bit about this amazing uh, preserve up on Agate Passage. Um, we want tonight to give you an introduction to this special place. Some of you have been out to the preserve before, um, but some of you, this might be the first time you have gotten to know about this place. And we want to share why we protected it and our overview of our management goals for the property, share some of the work that we have done, and most importantly, share how you can help us with the care of this land. And we're doing this in two parts. We're doing this introduction by Zoom, and then Andrew and Greg will be out at the property, and Lexi on December 4th, it's a Saturday, from 10 a.m. to noon and dive in a bit more to the attributes of the land and some of the tasks that we need some assistance with. And folks will be able to kind of get their hands dirty that day too. I think Andrew has some plans for you. <laughs> Bring your gloves. So let me just tell you a little bit about the land trust if you're not familiar with our organization. We are a 32 year old conservation nonprofit organization mm -hmm. on the island. That is our geographic focus um, is Bainbridge Island. We are a member of the Washington Association of Land Trusts, which is over 30 land trusts strong in Washington state. And we take a regional approach to our protection efforts, but still with an eye on our local community. To date, um, we have over 1,470 acres that we've protected, conserved, and stewarded. And we currently care for our properties we own, in addition to helping uh, take care of conservation easement properties with the private landowners who hold those lands. Caring for our lands <laughs> after protecting them is a real vital component of our work. And our stewardship and management program of the land trust is healthy and robust. And it is one of the ways that the members of our community can really get involved in these important landscapes, learn about these special places and be a part of taking care of them. And it's why we're here tonight. So let's take a nice close look at this gem. Um, it's nearly 12 and a half acres. Um, oh, let me go back. I'll tell you, <laughs> see the red circle up here, 2021? That's the Agate Passage Preserve. So now we'll zoom in real close um, to the actual preserve, which is a mix of upland intact forests, some open meadow areas, and some tidelands out to the extreme low tide. There's not a lot of parcels on Bainbridge that extend that out into the tidelands, and that's one of the really special attributes 
have this preserved. So how did we get to preserve this really special place? Uh, the Land Trust has a conservation plan that helps guide our conservation and protection strategies. And it helps us focus on where are some of our last best places and where might we be able to have the most ecological lift. Uh, two priority focus areas for us are the shorelines of the island and expanding and kind of connecting more the wildlife networks uh, those lands that have already been protected or those lands that are needed to connect these already protected lands. And so the networks of systems um, within the island is a real focus area. These maps I call the x-ray of the island. The black are emphasis areas, um, really high conservation values. And the white are um, maybe more developed or disturbed um areas and what we did to develop this is we kind of put together um, about 23 different layers of ecological functions um, or attributes streams wetlands shorelines uh, priority habitat areas for sensitive species and so upon building uh, these layers on top of each other we were able to identify um, where might we next want to focus our attention. Of course, with 53 miles of shoreline on the island, most of our shoreline is indeed high priority. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more. We also looked at, you know, what could happen around this property or how does it add to protection or conserve lands already in the area. And we really felt that this could be an anchor property of further protection efforts in the area or restoration. It's nearly contiguous with 19 and a half acres of and 25 linear feet, a state of Washington uh, Department of Natural Resources protected tidelands. Um, it's also downstream or downhill, so to speak, from seven acres of property protected by a conservation easement on the land trust. And so with this permanent protection of the preserve, in addition to these in proximity, over 38 acres and over 3,000 linear feet of nearly contiguous near, near shore processes and upland processes were protected. We do rely a lot on science as well as opportunity to guide our work. And the preserve was ranked number one and two for the highest near shore parcels for protection by the land trust in 2008 when we did a shoreline parcel analysis. It was also very highly ranked in the West Sound near shore integration study as highest priority for protection. And the West Sound is Bainbridge Island going over uh, across the pond towards um, up to point no point all the way down to the Tacoma Narrows. So it's quite a large area that it covers. So this was quite important for us to know that the work that we were doing was really in sync with what other um, ecological and uh, near shore scientists were thinking. So one of the really important attributes of um, this preserve is its feeder bluffs and the sediment supply. I don't know how many of you have been out to the preserve, but when you do go uh, December 4, uh, one of the things you will notice is this amazing uh, gradual um, sandy estuary um, in the tidelands. And that is really a result of the sediment being able to freely um, come down this very steep slope that's on the preserve and land on the beach and distribute um, amongst this reach. And out of 201 reaches around Bainbridge Island, this one 
was the one shown as having no impact. In other words, it hadn't been developed and it hadn't been armored. And therefore the ecological processes were still uh, fully functioning. I'm sorry, my dog must uh, hear something in the wind. <laughs> um, let me close the door. <laughs> sorry. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> um, in addition, the city did a near shore assessment clear back in 2004. And again, this was identified as one of the highest priority areas for protection. So we really try as a land trust to dive deep into our decisions of what to protect and then steward because we know once we buy it, we need to take care of it. And we like to be a model in that regard. <clears throat> Yeah, so here's our feeder bluff that we just adore. Um, and it's so important on Bainbridge Island and in Puget Sound because this is really a threatened habitat type when the sediment is not allowed to enter the shoreline system and distribute, then we lose things such as eelgrass beds and nice sandy beaches that are wonderful to walk on and that a lot of creatures really rely on as well. And so it's because of the development and armoring along the shore that Bainbridge Island has actually lost 60% of its shoreline length because of the cutting off of the historic sediment sources. Some of the other amazing attributes of this preserve is its undeveloped uh, shoreline, uh, 550 linear feet of no structures except for the structures of trees and downwood and it's really lovely it's just nice and messy trees falling down onto the beach and it's really what Puget Sound looked like decades ago um, this intact intact near shore vegetation provides um, you know leaf litter and insects and shade and all the things that are required for our creatures that live in this environment to have safe haven to hide and um, be able to be there through all their life stages. All of Bainbridge Island shoreline is classified as critical habitat for Chinook, which is uh, ESA listed species. And Chinook is the primary food source for another endangered species, our resident orca whales. And so without this kind of structure and habitat available, those species really are gonna have a hard time uh, recovering. So protection of these kinds of landscapes is the highest priority action uh, in the Puget Sound Partnership Action Agenda. This intersection of this complex beach and the upland is just really dynamic and um, we're pretty proud of the fact that we were able to protect this amount of undeveloped shoreline on Bainbridge. The mother conservation attributes is this amazing over five acres of tidelands um, and it you go down there different times of the year the sand has shifted because of the weather patterns. Um, and we have this amazing feeder eelgrass bed that is contiguous down to the DNR, uh, the, the natural resource land. So this, this um, kind of greenish area here is both um, herring spawning. And I don't know if any of you have experienced when the uh, color of the water turns that turquoise blue around March um, and milky. That's the herring spawn that is happening. And as you can see, it's directly over the overlay of eelgrass. It's, the herring uh, rely on the eelgrass to attach their eggs. Um, and this habitat type also is quite threatened in the area. Interestingly, um, if you were to go in extreme low tide, you may see gooey duck folks um, harvesting and it's a gooey duck breeding area. It is um, 
an area that is really ideal for gooey duck that is a culturally significant um, species to the Suquamish and therefore um, pretty important to keep that um, population as healthy and intact as possible. Um, we also have um, smelt um, right along here in the upland area, I mean up, up reach area. Um, let's see. And USGS, US Geological Survey, has been out at the preserve a um, number of years monitoring the eelgrass populations. And it is a reference site actually within the whole West Sound area about the healthy population of eelgrass that's out there. Um, so keeping one of our stewardship goals is of course to keep that eelgrass uh, bed intact um, and contiguous with the DNR lands. It is rich in fish. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Um, when I first moved to Bainbridge in 2006, there was a cooperative beach stain study going on of all around uh, Bainbridge Island between the Suquamish tribe, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and um, city of Bainbridge Island and USGS was a part of that. And um, this site, um, and what that is, is they put a net into the water and then they gradually bring it into the shore. And it's a really fine mesh net and you can actually see all the different species composition. Um, and this place, had one of the highest concentrations of forage fish um, within all of the beach sand sites on Bainbridge Island. So important things such as sand lance, surf smelt, and herring, um, juvenile Chinook, um, coho, pink. I mean, that's a pretty long list of species and another reason why um, we felt this was really an important spot. The uplands are actually just as important as we are uh, warming environment, this intact uh, mature forest on the preserve provides cooling and hiding and great upland habitat, as well as helping with watershed function. Uh, there's a number of seeps that come down this hill and the intact vegetation helps control stormwater runoff um, from Highway 305 into Puget Sound. The wildlife is pretty amazing in Agate Passage. Um, according to the Puget Sound Marine Bird Density Atlas, um, Agate Pass Passage is identified as one of the areas in Salish Sea with the highest densities of sea ducks, both for feeding and resting. And actually, this is the time of the year they start showing up. And so, um, might put it on your list if you have a scope or some binoculars to go down there and see if some of these species pop into your lenses. Um, Western grebe, uh, golden eye, um, common loon. Harlequin duck and longtail gut duck. Many of these are species of concern in Puget Sound, and they find their home at Agate Passage uh, just off the shores and within the shores of the preserve. We have some resident blue herons. So if you go out, we haven't had a naming contest, but um, we do have a lot of friends <laughs> that are great blue herons out there. And, they are enjoying all that um, comes with the intertidal area. Um, most of the times I've been there, someone has something in their mouth. So um, good food resources, as well as shelter and um, ability to see around their environment. It's quite spectacular. Uh, jellyfish, tide pools, and then Greg, we have some amazing geologic features out there. I don't know if you'd like to say a few words about those. Um, 
Yeah, it's hard to just talk without standing there looking at them and showing things. <laughs> but there's, uh, you know, there are, uh, I don't know, one of the things I talk to people about are, is all the faulting related to potential earthquakes uh, in our area. And there's a famous fault down at, under the south end of the island, the Seattle Fault, which is, is really dangerous. But there's there are a lot of small faults cutting across the island. And some of them are mapped, some of them, some of them aren't. Uh, one of them is very apparent right in this uh, in this area. It cuts across. It uh, it depends on where the sand is, whether it's exposed or not. But when it's exposed, it's very apparent. It cuts across our inner tidal and up through uh, one of our uh, our meadows. And you can see its effect in that one side of the meadow uh, is very stays very green even in the dry months. It gets plenty of water, but then the water moving downhill hits the uh, the fracture where the fault is and apparently drains down into that. So the other side of the fault is is very dry. So hopefully you all have an opportunity to be out there with Greg sometime and he can point out these features. This was one of the walks we did a number of years ago down at the beach and Greg did a great job helping interpret what we were looking at. So you're right, Greg, it's better in person. <laughs> because of all these amazing uh, features of this island's landscape, we were very successful in obtaining a number of federal and state public grants to support this acquisition. Um, in fact, we received uh, 1.2 million to help cover the purchase price, as well as some of the restoration endeavors that we have participated in. In addition, we did receive about 230,000 in private donations to help us with things such as stair repair and ongoing stewardship and management work. So once we get a property, and even as we're looking at acquiring a property, um, we dive in pretty deep. We like to learn what is there and how things might be working now. And are there improvements we might like to make to reach certain goals? And so we take a while sometimes to learn as much as we can about these um, preserves before we dive into doing actions. Um, and the result of learning a lot about this place was we did identify some main themes for management, long-term management of this property. Uh, we did want well-planned passive use. It's an amazing place. Um, we wanted people to be able to come and enjoy and especially to access the beach. There's just not a lot of opportunity on the west side of the island for people to be able to get down to the beach. So that was a priority for us. We also wanted to provide an educational opportunity to learn about the near shore environment. Because again, there's not many um, habitats like this on the island. The close um, property part of the Gasm Preserve is another really good example of this kind of steep slope intact vegetation, but this um, shoreline vegetation, but this preserve is just slightly larger than that segment of the Gasm Preserve. Um, so we also wanted to keep as much of the habitat intact and functioning as possible with very limited um, disturbance. So this helps inform how many trails might we have? Do we have picnic tables or not? What are some of the things that we decide to put on a property versus not? Then we look at, hey, do we need to improve any of the conditions um, and what might that look like and how long might that take? And what are the resources we need to get that accomplished? And most importantly, we want to sustain and maintain the conditions either as they are naturally, or if we work to restore something, we want to be able to take care of that restoration effort. So this is a map of the actual preserve infrastructure. And as you can see, there's not a lot. Um, there's wetlands, there's seeps, 
there's this big steep bluff. This is part of our feeder bluff here on the west side of the property. There's the intact forest. Here's the highway, just for a little context, hot Highway 305. There were originally some cleared areas. Those may have been cleared for um, development. And we've been working really hard to kind of bring those back and improve the depth of the riparian zones along the shore. But what you can see here is there's a very small parking area, probably about three cars, maybe four, those are really small. Uh, we have a porta potty, we have an interpretive sign and kiosk, and then we have the trails that enter in to the preserve. And essentially we have a loop trail. You can go down uh, by stairs. There's a viewing platform as well and reach the beach. And then there's another loop. This is a maintenance entrance here. This is not a parking entrance. So as you can see, there's not really a lot of infrastructure um, on this property. And that is by design um, as we strove to have this be a passive use um, opportunity for the public. We did have some interpretive signs developed to explain all that's going on out there. There's a lot. And so both as you enter off of the beach as well as enter off of the upper parking area, the public does have a chance to learn about the features here. Um, these signs um, are items we'd like to duplicate on our preserves. We find that they can be really helpful if we don't have the likes of Andrew or Greg or someone out to lead a tour. But we have had opportunities out on this preserve for walks and we hope to now with COVID, um, maybe in a different phase, uh, re-up those opportunities. The limited parking limits impacts, both not just to the preserve, but our neighbors. We like to be good neighbors. When we purchase lands, we always meet with our neighbors ahead of time to get their feedback and suggestions and hear their concerns. And we certainly did that in the case of this preserve. And we really wanted to not have a lot of people at the preserve at one time. So it's really a walk-in, bike-in, you could paddle in from Agate Passage. Um, and there is two places for us to park for maintenance. We do try to encourage larger groups. A lot of people do like to come out in large walking groups and they can park down at Centennial River Park, and there is a pathway along the west side of 305 up to the gravel drive that goes to the preserve. This could be a project um, of improving this path um, by the Friends Group, as sometimes it can get pretty overgrown and um, doesn't feel all that comforting sometimes to be right next to the highway. I spoke a little bit about getting to know the preserve, and we did. Um, and as part of that, we did an inventory of the existing conditions and identified the actions. This is a map that shows um, kind of existing conditions clear back in 2013 of where certain invasive species plants um, were on the property. And this really helps guide um, our actions. We do this on all our preserves. We inventory what's out there, identify what the actions are. And actions within each one of these circles, whether it's purple or yellow or orange or green, might be different. Can, you know, just depending on the conditions that we're trying to tackle. Um, Andrew is very careful to remind me that this map is not stagnant. This map changes over time. Um, hopefully these circles are no longer invasive plant circles, but they are different plant communities um, that are native plants getting us to a new place um, where we want to go for habitats. Um, we utilize 
our staff and volunteers and contractors to accomplish our restoration and maintenance work. Um, but this is a property that certainly has had a lot of volunteer um, efforts on that and we'll concentrate a little bit more on that. Let's see, next slide. So once we removed uh, invasive plants for the first time, we then wanted to manage those invasive plants for one or two years. And then we did some pretty aggressive plantings. Um, we planted over 2000 plants uh, around 2015. All of those got some mulch around them and all of them have had weeding done around them since uh, they were installed. And uh, very importantly, they all got watered. <laughs> and that was a huge effort that we'll, we'll talk about. But we talked a little bit about different zones doing different functions. This zone number seven, um, as an example, was an area, and I'll probably show you some pictures of it uh, a little bit later here, that was all reed canary grass. And um, that's not a real friendly grass. It likes to take over, doesn't allow anyone else to come in. And so we identified this as a high priority, as well as, um, it, you know, things had kind of been cleared up to the shore. And in order to regain some stability along the feeder rut bluff and gain what we call the near shore riparian area intact vegetation, we did a lot of plantings here. We did plantings, for instance, along the North prop property line for privacy purposes, both for visitors of the preserve, as well as the adjoining landowners. So each time we put a zone together, we're trying to think, what is it that we would like to try to see happen here over time? And you do have to be patient, it does take some time. So I'm just gonna stroll through. Clear back in 2013, we started with some cleanup um, and invasive removal. Here's a 2017 work party that actually shows an area that had been cleared and planted and mulched. And that was a huge effort. And so we use both contractors and volunteers for that. Um, once we put in all those 2000 plants, um, things got really hot that summer. Uh, we usually try to plant in the fall for high survival fall and winter, but that first summer was really brutal. And the second summer, and the third summer. <laughs> so we had this amazing crew that Greg helped coordinate uh, through Eagle Harbor Congregational Church. They were our water warriors. They came out on a regular basis. They were our holes haulers and they helped keep these plants alive. But that's a huge commitment. And it's something we take pretty seriously if we're gonna invest the time, we really wanna be able to make sure those um, efforts get supported. Work party up to this year. We've also hired, have had a team conservation crew, um, except for 2020 and 2021 due to COVID, but they have been really integral um, out on this preserve with, again, mulching, planting, and weed suppression. Give you a few examples of before and after. This is our reed canary grass meadow on the left-hand side. It's quite lovely, don't you think? Um, all green and here's Greg in 2018. And you can just see some of these conifers popping up here. You have a lot more diversity in the vegetation over on the left. And then on the right, you see a lot of willows that were planted. And the idea behind the willows, and down below you see the little stakes of the willows. The idea behind the willows is the willows will shade out the reed canary grass. And eventually the reed canary grass will not like that. So this flight is the first step that we took to control the reed canary grass with other plantings such as 
maple and other conifers like fir, some grand fir are in here, that they can come up when the willows start to lose their effectiveness. Because really what we want is a bigger root structure like the large conifer to help with the hydrologic um, system in here and to build that kind of structural up and down habitat type too. So this is one area that we see changing again over time to perhaps not be a willow meadow, to perhaps be more of a mixed forest meadow or mixed forest in the future. These are some other examples of, um, you know, where things have been planted. They're gradually kind of coming up, takes a while, and lots of watering. So before and an after. more. This is an after. The willows are much higher than Greg is in, in this photo. You will see Greg in a lot of photos. He's out there a lot. <laughs> and this is a really nice before and after. Um, on the left was the uh, clump of blackberry and invasive cherry and all sorts of not very fun things. Um, and just after the planting, we put in a fence really for safety purposes. But the idea here is the plants will grow up and there'll be this physical barrier. Um, if you go out there right now, it's getting pretty close. And then the fence basically goes away over time. It just kind of disintegrates into the vegetation. Another really good before of uh, blackberry and a planting area afterwards. And I think, Andrew, this is our team crew out there with you. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's our uh, 2018 crew. And uh, I'm laughing because all these plants now, if you go out uh, tomorrow in, in the rain, they're about three times the size. And it's only a few years out of date. Yeah. And this is another uh, perspective. There was a lot of scotch broom, for instance, out in the meadow. Um, Andrew will let you know how long that, um, and Jeanette too, how long that seed bank uh, lasts. And um, it's a lifelong journey to control the scotch broom out there, but it's looking pretty nice right now. The Scouts have been really helpful on our preserves. And so this is kind of the before setup out there with the parking. This is the small parking area and the kind of welcome center. But the scouts helped construct this um, in area, uh, shelter for the porta potty. And then barn, uh, the Bay Bridge um, Artesian uh, network on the island helped us with this kiosk. So it's really great to have the community participate and help us um, make these preserves really welcoming and um, really lovely. And here's one of our interpreters, interpreter signs in the background. Also the area where we unloaded all the hoses, right, Greg? <laughs> the stairs was a huge project. Um, on the left here, um, you can see the dilapidated stairs, uh, blackberry overgrowing them, um, and we replaced them with um, a system that we hope will hold up over time, at least until the feeder bluff really gives way, and then we'll have to decide what to do after that time. But um, again, on the left is what was there, and on the right is really, you know, safe and sturdy. And these are graded stairs to allow the water to flow through. And so we did not want to disrupt, you know, the natural process of um, what's going on on the feeder bluff as much as possible. So this is a really nice uh, feature for the public use. Um, again, the before and after. 
this was our first set of stairs, really, that we had ever built <laughs> for the land trust. We learned a lot. <laughs> we do monitor um, on our lands uh, every year, if not more. And so we are indeed monitoring uh, what's going on in this segment. We try to use the same profile area as um, where the old stairs were. So we we're not disrupting any other portion of the of the Peter Bluff. Okay, I am now going to turn it over to Andrew, who is going to dive in a bit more about French Group, now that you know a little bit more about the preserve and how um, we're hoping um, folks can continue to be involved and launch us forward. Andrew? Thanks, Brenda. Uh Thank you. I was a whole lot. Um, I just before maybe dive in too much to what can you do? I actually want to, want to open this up to a little bit to the general public. Do you all have any questions? You know, we just had a whole lot of material thrown at you. And I just want to open that up. You want to learn a few things before we move on to uh, potential activities. I also want to encourage. Um, folks to put questions into the chat if you would like, and we can certainly come back to those. Okay, Andrew. All right, well, we'll move, keep moving on. I'm sure you'll all come to you in about two minutes when I'm midway through my other talk. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, so like I said earlier, um, the, part, the Friends of Group is really to help facilitate the protection, stewardship of these properties. Um, you know, the land trust does a lot of great work. We have a lot of volunteers, but we can't get out to the properties as much as they really need to. Uh, we have a first Wednesday work party every month, the no, first Wednesday of every month, where we get volunteers from across the island. And we come to a property, um, but we have, oh gosh, I think uh, 14 different properties now. They get regular work parties and only 12 months a year, there's a slight math issue on this. So the friends of group is just a really great way of, you know, keeping up on it, you know, making sure, you know, it's much easier to deal with one blackberry plant before it becomes, you know, a 20 foot stretch uh, to regularly trim all the trails. I can't tell you how often, especially on this property, I will blaze a trail, clean it back, and then about two weeks later, Greg is emailing me about the trail filled in. I'm like, I was just there, and especially those stairs. Um, so the Friends of Group is just a really great way of, you know, allowing you, energizing you, empowering you to help take care of those things and facilitate it in a way that flows and works with the land trust, with our mission or goals to the property, um, but just give you that empowerment to do it for it. So um, next slide, please, Brenda. Sorry, it is stuck. One moment. <laughs> Sorry. And as, as we get into this, uh, I'll make this little ping on it. Our December 4th work party, uh, not say work party, um, training is actually going to be the hands-on component of this. So today is really the upper level talking about it. Um, but I don't really want to get into the level of knit and gritty via virtual talk. It's much better out there and getting your hands involved and a whole lot more fun than another Zoom meeting at the end of the day. So um, as I said before, um, these friends of groups really to let you all help take care of these tasks in a much more timely manner than I can handle it. Um, you can do it both as part of a group. You know, Greg is really great already about organizing group work parties. But there's also certain tasks which, if you're walking down the trail, you could do yourself, or you just want to like, hey, I got I got an extra hour, or got 20 minutes, I'm walking out there, I just really want to do something. You can do that solo on it. So um, the big task, which you're always welcome to do, is invasive species removal. It's there. Greg and I have done, and Landris done a lot to tackle it, but somehow those birds keep bringing back the blackberry and ivy, no matter how much I try killing it. So uh, if you can help me on that, that would be awesome. 
Um, the other one is native plant installation. We did our really big planting back in 2015, but as those willows are getting taller and larger, we're starting to do underplanting of it. There's certain spots that as things develop, we know, hey, we can get more vegetation. Um, I will fess up if you come to the De um, December 4th um, training, I have plants to install so you get some fun hands-on time to do it. Um, but then come the summer, watering becomes very key and important. Um, Brooke and Greg were our heroes this summer of watering for it, but we always need more, especially we do some more plantings in other parts farther to the north. Um, trail maintenance is a big one. I talk about vegetation, kind of trimming back, what's that standard, but also you get naughty visitors who like to make new trails where there shouldn't be trails. So you as the friends of group will notice when someone's blazing a trail where it shouldn't and can shut that down a lot faster than I can on it. And that's always the key with social trails is if you can stop it, the sooner you stop it, the less it becomes established. Um, also big ones are, you know, luckily it hasn't been a major issue on this property, but it could be in the future, um, trash pickup. Um, you know, dogs aren't allowed on the pro on the preserve, so there's not a lot of poop bags, which is great. Um, but you know, once in a while, something might wash on, sh on shore at the beach or gets blown on in. So if you can kind of pick it up, um, that's good. We have an annual beach cleanup across the entire island. This is a great spot for it. And then, as always, as a friends of group, you're on the ground. You're on the property more than I am. So if there's major issues or concerns let me know. I'm always responsive. You're the eyes on the ground. And um, that always, we also want feedback and support because again, you're the people who this property is here to preserve uh, for the whole island. So we want to get your feedback and your suggestions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so for invasive species removal, um, you're only doing manual and mechanical work. <laughs> no herbicides, no goats, you're just there on it. Um, well, eventually we we're already talking about installing some little small tool lockers out on the property with some grab bag of various equipment so you don't always have to bring in your own. Um, we're still working on that. Um, but the big challenges for this property, um, for the preserve are English ivy, the blackberry, holly laurel, the choke cherry, and the scotch broom. Um, I will fess up, if you don't know Scotch Room, the seed bank lasts for 90 years up to that. Um, we've been great, we're not letting it go to seed, so we only have another 84 years to go. We can do it. <laughs> um, and the cool thing about it is a lot of these invasives, um, as long as they're not touching the ground, you can cold compost on the site. So you don't need the haul of material off the property. You can actually leave it there. It becomes nat all the nutrients which they have locked up goes back into the site. So it becomes a positive thing. Um, I will let you know heads up on it that a few times during the year, um, I will be putting notices up and shutting down the property to the public because um, we do have herbicide access from the land trust. Um, so things like Canada thistle, um, really big patches of blackberry on those steep bluffs. I don't want you as volunteers going out there. And so that's on us, the staff. So we will shut down the preserve for a few days um, and then do it and then reopen it again once it's a bit safe for that. Next slide, please. That I love the size of that shore pine in that picture. It they are, like compared. I said, this was from this year's work party. And I can tell you those shore pines have shot up this last yeah. two years. They're doing great. Um, plantings, that's always going to be a key one, and that's actually become an even bigger one over the next few years. Um, Greg and I have already plotted, I think, the next three years worth of plantings in several sites out there, so that's going to be a very key one. Um, that's work we always do in the fall and winter, um, and then during the next two to three years, we really need watering. Um, so we'll be putting up some setups to make it easy for you as volunteers, but we do need you as volunteers to go out there, and on those hot days or preferably in the morning, so you're not hot, uh, you know, go out there and water the plants. That helps them get leg up, get it well-established, and then go on the next stuff. And then other great other tasks, such as uh, mulching once in a while, um, weeding, like that grass gets really tall, so kind of pulling it back so the plants can have space and room to grow. Um, and then, as we all know from our windy days today, uh, some plants get knocked over. Um, they need a little support. So you'll occasionally go out there and 
with some stakes and twine and restraighten the trees till they get a little more established on it. Or a big old tree across the trail. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a little later on, yeah. So uh, speaking of trails, uh, so a big one for us is the trail maintenance audit. So most of our trails on this property are um, just dirt and wood on it. We're not going to ever do any big paved roads here. This, we want this a very natural and passive um, enjoyment. Um, they keep the trails narrow. Again, we want to have that unique personal experience. So their trails are only about one to three feet wide with up to additional three feet of vegetation kind of cut back on the side. So if you're ever out there and you're like, gosh, this blackberry is coming in or the willows are kind of coming in at my face, you can trim them back a bit. It's okay. Uh, we're well, we totally welcome it. Um, and then, you know, this, like I said, something that actually it regularly needs, especially I would say May through July are the prime times where everything is growing crazy. And so one of you could do it on Monday and by Wednesday, I promise you, someone else could do the exact same work <laughs> on the property. <laughs> Um, now, we do occasionally get trees that do fall across the trails. Um, that is something, let me know. Uh, and I have a, a go-to person who I does all my uh, tree removal with. So um, as that many of you might know, there used to be the limbo tree on the north side of the trail, uh, on the north side of the property. You had a uchi underneath it to get along that trail. And we took it out. Um, and so if there's other trees that fall across, especially this winter or the spring, let me know as soon as possible and I'll get out there and kind of clear it out of the way. So um, and again, social trails, shut them down as soon as possible. Um, you're the best people to find them. Next slide, please. Um, and then there's the other grab bag tasks. You're walking along, you might see it. So if you do see any trash, like small little stuff, please, if you're able to just grab it, haul it out there. If we don't let the trash accumulate ever, people don't think of dumping their trash. Um, there's a very much a cyclical relationship. As soon as they see a little bit, they start dumping more and more and more. And so if we can stop it when it's early, that's the best. Um, now, occasionally big stuff does end up on the property, typically after winter storms on the beach. Um, you do not need to take that home. <laughs> Just bring it up to the top of the, uh, of the property by the parking area. Give me a call and I will get out there and haul it away. So, uh, there was a great pile this last winter uh, where various people had done that. Uh, I think there's some fish buoys, some old twine, rope, um, and I got out there and hauled away. And so that's that great kind of partnership where you all will see it a lot sooner than I will, and then I can haul it away and support your actions. Um, again, there's the annual beach cleanup. We would love if friends of group can adopt the site and say, we got this. Um, and then... Again, you're the eyes and ears on the ground. So if you see any issues of concern, um, you know, inappropriate use of the property, new trails, like if it becomes the next mega party spot on Bainbridge Island, let me know and stop Greg from having his, you know, that massive co coolers back there. But, you know, all the same things. <laughs> I know what geologists get up to, Greg. I know it's going to be you. Uh, <laughs> so these are all the sorts of things where, you know, as friends of uh, Agate Passage, you can make big support and really help protect the property um, into the forever for everyone. Yeah, let me know when you go on vacation, Andrew, and I'll organize my next woodsy. I, I knew it. <laughs> I, that's why I don't ever reveal anything. <laughs> so um, with that, um, I'm almost done. We'll take your questions, but um, we do hope that you've had fun learning a bit about the property today. We'll have this as recording um, so you can learn it some more. Um, we will be doing, again, the hands-on training um, the, um, the December 4th on Saturday, um, 10 a.m. to noon. Um, again, parking is limited, so if you're able to, um, walk-in is great. Otherwise, that rotary park is a great option or carpooling. Um, and we'll be focusing on doing, you know, you've seen the maps. So if you haven't been to the property yet, we're going to walk around, talk about the areas, get that orientation um, I'll show you where not to go down the bluffs, like I have. Uh, we'll also talk about invasive species, what's the best approach, uh, techniques to do it. Um, we'll do some trail standards on trimming. And like I said, I got plants to install, so I would love to get you out there and do some planting. Um, and again, 
you're more than welcome to do this both as a group. Greg will be organizing some work parties, um, but you can also do it solo. Um, we'll have some uh, volunteer hour tracking. So just on Google Forms, so do ask if you do something, even as simple as, hey, I trimmed while I was walking today, I was trimming the trail, let us know. These are valuable hours we really wanna know. Um, or if you were out there and you're, you know, bringing back that piece of trash from the beach, that's a volunteer hour. So let us know, that's really great. Um, we'll have some other work parties with the main land trust first Wednesday, so you will never be alone. Um, and then we'll also be doing um, this again. We really wanna have an annual check-in with all of you as friends of, um, so you can let us know, you know, what have you seen this last year? What would you like to know? We'll talk about the goals, um, get that feedback because, you know, this isn't just the land trust land. This is for the entire island community. And as our friends of group, you are that community. So we really want to get your thoughts, feedbacks and going for that. So um, with that, this is the QR code on it. So you have the recording, you can sign up for the December 4th training. Um, but otherwise, I open this up, um, please, if you have any questions, we're all here to answer them. It, and thank you for your afternoon with us, evening with us. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks thank a lot. You. So I think I'll uh, shut down the presentation and we can all see each other's uh, faces. I can certainly go back to anything later on, but um, would love to know if, uh, Greg, you have anything you'd like to add and questions or items from those that are participating. Oh, here's a question. Oh, you, will you send the link for the uh, December 4th training out to the group? Yes, for sure. We will send out a, a reminder uh, and uh, reiterate instructions about where you might find parking and uh, how to dress and all that kind of stuff. We make no promises about the weather though. Yeah, I want to uh, just throw in something uh, that that was just terrific, uh, Brenda and Andrew, uh, terrific slides and all kinds of information. Really cool. Um, <clears throat> we're, uh, Brenda talked about it being a, uh, the property being a place for education and for learning. And I want to point out that the land trust is still in a learning mode about our forest. Well, as are all biologists and scientists, uh, you know, we're all facing climate change and concerned about that. And as well as other things, fire risk and, and a host of subjects. And <clears throat> one of the things that the uh, land trust and the stewardship group has going on now, there's a, uh, a group uh, we call the Forest Service Advisory, Advisory Group, uh, that's looked after by Gina uh, King, a uh, land trust wildlife biologist. And it's a group of forestry experts. And uh, we've hired uh, a contractor, uh, Keith, um, oh, help me, Hanson? Hanson. Hanson, <laughs> uh, who's a sustainable forestry uh, expert. And uh, he's been visiting uh, pretty much all of our properties. Uh, a few of them he's writing detailed uh, reports on about uh, the health of the forest and things we could consider to make it even healthier. And uh, he has visited this, uh, this uh, Agate Passage Preserve and uh, he will have a sort of a smaller version of recommendations on what we could do there, uh, you know, in, in the way of planting and things to enhance habitat uh, in a few small places, we might consider thinning uh, some of the uh, places where lots of trees have grown up and they're all crowding each other out. So uh, I find all that stuff really fascinating and interesting. And, uh, you know, as that becomes available, we will share it with you guys and uh, we will be adjusting our priorities as far as plantings and weedings uh, as we learn, you know, from now, from now on. Yeah, thanks, Greg, for adding that in. It, it is true. We started with our restoration plans, um, you know, closely after we closed on the property in 2013. And as time goes on, you know, you just have to adjust and look at what has happened, what has been working, what did we still need to know about. So we're really kind of in that 
area right now, uh, kind of taking a look at what else we might need to be thinking about. So your thoughts, you know, many of you may have backgrounds that we're not aware of that know a lot about these systems or places, and we really welcome that knowledge to be part of taking care of these lands. And just as Andrew said, eyes on the ground. <laughs> Okay, want to be sure if people uh, have a John question. John has his hand up. I think okay. he has a question. I've got a, I've got a yellow background, so it doesn't oh. show very clearly. <laughs> I see it now, John. Uh, got a, I got a couple of questions. One is kind of specific to uh, the discussion tonight, and it's just a sort of a technical question. I imagine we get some visitors that come from the water uh, and uh, kayakers and my small boaters. Uh, is the is the property posted in any way that's visible to uh, folks who would be coming from the uh, from Agate Passage itself? Not at the moment. Okay. Um, we did consider posting a Kitsap County Water Trail sign, uh, but we haven't yet. And one of the reasons, John, was we wanted that vegetation on that North Meadow to grow up a little bit more, have a little bit more privacy. Um, but the word is out. You see during paddling season, a number of people that will stop there. Um, but I think there'll be a time maybe where it becomes a little bit more of um, a discovery type of place than more known type of place. But right now it's not really, I think, is there a sign down at the bottom of the stairs that says Bainbridge Island Land Trust Conservation? Yeah, it's, it's not very big, but if you were yeah. walking up um, kind of curious uh, whose stairs are whose, uh, that there is one that does say it's the Bainbridge Island Land Trust and you can use it. Um, okay. Uh, my second question that maybe is more for the uh, stewardship committee at some point, but as a 33 years as a field biologist and intertidal biologist, I was salivating looking at your intertidal zone um, <laughs> and thinking about what a wonderful place it would be to do some research. Has Have you ever considered the possibility of making uh, not only this property, but other properties uh, within the land trust available as uh, small scale field research sites for folks from the local universities. And the reason why I ask that is once this starts, uh, the amount of information that you gain, uh, the uh, insights that uh, young folks will bring as they're maybe doing a master's or uh, some of their PhD thesis research uh, becomes, an, 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 I think, an incredible sort of added value contribution uh, to the lands themselves. And, and Greg might have some geologists that are interested. Uh, I, I not, haven't connected with, uh, uh, with the University of Washington. Uh, folks in, the, <clears throat> in this meeting, I was out of the country for 33 years in the tropics doing research. So I'm kind of new to this area, but um, uh, I can see where that could be a win-win situation uh, for uh, ourselves and for uh, young folks looking for a preserve, a place where they're gonna be able to maybe put out a stake or a small cage or some sort of a small scale manipulation and not have it disappear overnight, uh, which is always a problem, uh, regardless of where you are in the world. So it's just a thought. Uh, it just occurred to me while we were going through this and describing the property. And uh, I just, uh, if I were to start over again in this part of the world, I would say, oh boy, this is, looks like a really neat place to do something. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, John. I, I, we haven't put the all call out um, as you know, we try to figure out, gosh, you know, what are the things we would want to have happen? But what I can say is USGS and Pacific Northwest Labs um, use this site regularly as a reference site. They have mm -hmm. come and gathered a lot of baseline data. Um, and the land trust certainly is not opposed. We have people that go to our preserves for bat surveys or fish 
presence surveys. And so we are quite open to those opportunities, um, as you can say. As you said, they're very enriching. Everyone learns. Um, so we've actually hosted a non number of you uh, capstone students over the years uh, for their um, studies. And so certainly I don't think we're opposed. One of the things we do try to be sure if we say yes to a study is, um, you know, understand the activities that would take place as part of that study. Do they need supervision by staff or a volunteer or a docent to be with them? Um, so to just understand the scope yeah. and scale. Yeah, there certainly would be some mechanics involved and some some uh, definite listing of expectations in both, uh, with both, uh, both parties. Yeah. So. Anyway, just a thought. Uh, so potentially, you know, I'd love to study the spawning of those uh, of those fishes. That would be fantastic. Very interesting seasonality and who's the predators and success rates and so on and so forth. Over time, it could uh, it could be a very interesting story of many many possible stories to develop in our uh, this property yeah, the, or, and or others. Yeah, the tribe is the main lead on the herring spawn study mm. going on in this area. Right. Good Questions. <laughs> yeah, one uh, another thing part I'd like to do or, or uh, a bit of gratitude uh, for recording this because I know that uh, there are a lot of people interested in this project and interested in helping out that for one reason or another couldn't join us tonight. And so it's going to be invaluable to be able to provide a, a recording, especially of the presentations and the slides and pictures and things that uh, we can share that around. Yeah. Well, we certainly don't want to keep folks longer than necessary <laughs> tonight, um, but we certainly do want to encourage folks to participate um, in the December 4th um, gathering and training. And then from there, uh, really excited to kind of conquer and divide whatever the tasks are that people are comfortable taking on and are willing to and plan uh, what's going to take place in 2022 and beyond out there, or maybe next month and beyond. <laughs> Right. And uh, actually, I have a, a uh, it's not a question. Hi, I'm Virginia. Sorry, my my picture behind me, there's a light kind of blasting in, in your all eyes. But I did want to introduce myself um, for for one reason alone. And that was um, a story I just want to quickly share uh, about the preserve. Um a neighbor who lives there uh, near near the preserve. She and I are friends, and we we walk down to the beach. And when we got down to the to the beach, there were four or five teenagers down there, and they were building a fort. And we stopped and asked them what they were doing, and they told us, you know, they were bored. And I think this was during COVID, so I think it was last year. Um, and they, they didn't, they, they were claiming that what they were doing was completely harmless. And, um, we challenged them on that and we said, no, this is a land trust property and, and you need to leave all the wood that's washed ashore in place. And they were like, who said, you know, they were super aggressive and very, um, kind of snotty. They were just rude. And both the both my friend and I were were feeling somewhat, you know, concerned because of their aggressive and lack of respect for the for the property. So we get we left them alone and we came back and and about you know half an hour, 30, 45 minutes later, and they were still building against our request to stop. And so they, we said, well, you know, we may have to consult some authorities on this. And um, 
And uh, because this is not what you're supposed to do in, in, in this, on these kinds of properties. And they were like, well, yeah, sure. Go right ahead. You know, go ahead, call the cops. You know, they were just over the top. And so we said, well, you know, I guess we will just have to take matters into our own hands because what you're doing is illegal. And so sure enough, you know, I know Jane Stone and I texted her and she, and then my friend Paul Johnson also got in touch with somebody at the land trust. And I'm not sure if you, Brenda, were that person. Yeah, you are. Yeah. And Greg. And Greg. Yeah, okay. Brenda was, Bre yeah, Brenda and I went down there and this is a Thank great you. example great example of what Andrew has been talking about eyes on the ground you see something yep. that either has happened or is going on and uh you know uh, letting us know uh just will really help uh, so Brenda and I walked down there and uh and uh Brenda d disarmed them <laughs> uh in a social <laughs> way uh they they weren't aggressive uh she she very nicely explained what the land trust is about what we're trying to right. do and we really uh you know, don't want people, uh, you know, building stuff, even if they're temporary and kids uh, on the beach there. Right. And so they, uh, they took it down and. Uh, yeah. Great. Well, they, they, they weren't listening to us and we knew it was a losing battle. Um, they had their dander up and, and they were just going to fist, you know, fist and cuffs kind of attitude towards us because I guess we had no authority to them. So I guess that was, you know, I, I see the, the, the reasoning behind, you know, like you said, people going out there in the neighborhood. I live on Agate Woods, so it's, it makes a complete sense for me to participate in a, this kind of a group because I can walk across 305 and, and, and go over there quite easily. But um, anyway, I just wanted to pass that on. It's nice to meet you, Greg and Brenda, and know that you were the saviors that day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Virginia, for, for all your work and, and no keeping problem. a good eye out there. It's, yeah, it, it, it's it thanks to you for seeing it. Otherwise, yeah. we wouldn't have known for days yeah. afterwards. And we wouldn't have had that opportunity to talk with the kids and, you know, explain it. And, you know, right. It was know, they, they probably went down the street. But, you know, it's that talking, that first touch, because you don't know, like, you know, now that they've had that experience talking about. Oh, you know, these are habitat. They are involved. It's not just dead wood moving about. They are part of the critical habitat. You know, that is an well, educational so moment, you know, and exactly. you know, some state parks where they build forts every two feet. And, you know, you don't see anything what the natural beach looks like anymore. So, again, it's that first brush, that quick touch. You know, if you try it with yourselves, it doesn't work. That's yeah. what the land trust is here for. So we appreciate you doing it. And never feel wrong giving us a call and we're happy to get out there yeah thank happy you thing. keep on going out there <laughs> <laughs> okay well we sure appreciate you spending your evening with us tonight and your interest in this really special spot and we hope to see you uh, December 4th. And if December 4th doesn't work for you for some reason, but you're still interested, by all means, we have other ways of, you know, getting you in touch with Andrew or Greg or someone else that's on the Zoom today or tonight um, and maybe have a buddy system. So we just want to make sure people know that if you're interested, there's a way that we'll work with you to have you involved. Hey, yeah, Lexi, do you have anything else you'd like to share for follow-up or volunteers? Uh, no, I dropped the link to register in the chat if people want it. Um, and if they have any questions, you can sure send them my way. You should all have my email because I've been emailing you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I look forward to seeing you and hopefully more of your friends on the 4th. Yeah. Indeed, spread the word. <laughs> All right.